Professor Wise Guy here, leading off with a song today. I like bananas, coconuts, and grapes. That's why they call me Tarzan of the Apes. <laughs> you know, come to think of it, that might be one of the silliest songs I know. Even by the standards of silly camp songs, that one is pretty ridiculous. But it's a perfect lead-in to today's topic. The 1912 novel by Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan of the Apes. The character of Tarzan has now been around for over a hundred years. Every decade or so, Hollywood trots out a new version of the story with some hard body guy putting on a loincloth and swinging through the trees. Why have I decided to read and report on Burroughs' first Tarzan novel? I blame you. Actually, in my recent five minute fix on sentence fragments, I made reference to Tarzan. After that, it occurred to me that while having seen a handful of those movies, I had never read a single page of any Tarzan book. Why not? A well, part of me always assumed that Edgar Rice Burroughs was British, while I focus on American literature. But then I realized that Burroughs was American, born in Chicago, died in California. Don't be fooled by the shenanigans of Disney either. Both Jane and her father, Professor Archimedes Q. Porter, are Americans from Maryland. Tarzan, of course, was born to British parents. Not just British parents, but a British lord and lady. Burroughs, on the other hand, is decidedly American. So why had I, the American literature professor, not read at least this first book? Well, I felt troubled. With that in mind, I checked out Tarzan of the Apes from my local library and set to work correcting this hole in my knowledge. Doesn't take long to recognize why Burroughs was a successful writer. He could spin a tale of adventure, describing events in ways that make them alternately vivid and mysterious. He knew how to withhold information to heighten suspense and to explain matters fully to prevent confusion. He could plot effectively and not leave gaping holes in the story's fabric. Do I then recommend Edgar Rice Burroughs without hesitation? Not exactly, or at least I would offer him unrecommended with a caution. Let's start with this Tarzan guy. He's the furthest thing from an environmentalist, I must say. You know that thing about Native Americans using every part of the buffalo? Well, let's be clear that Tarzan was not a Lakota. He'd kill a mature lion and take a meal from it, leaving the rest of the carcass behind. He seems to take great delight in killing, doing it not just for food or self-defense, but also for revenge and, most troubling, just for sport. At one point, he heads off into the jungle to kill a lion on a bet. Think of Teddy Roosevelt in a loincloth. <laughs> now try to get that image out of your head. Actually, though, we shouldn't blame Tarzan. We should lay any fault at the feet of Tarzan's creator, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Now, I'm not a fan of cancel culture, but Burroughs should be a prime candidate for canceling. If there were a statue of him somewhere, it probably ought to get knocked over by some outraged mob. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I do not condone statue knocking over. Now let's just say that Burroughs' attitudes toward different races do not exactly rise to modern standards. In Tarzan of the Apes, an African tribe moves into the area where Tarzan lives. There goes the neighborhood. Tarzan's first encounter with his tribe is when one of their number, completely unprovoked, kills Tarzan's mother. Tarzan follows this rather cavalier fellow and exacts his revenge. So far, not too bad. But the portrayal of this tribe is troubling. First, the tribe's members are almost always referred to as the Blacks. That's it. Skin color is a shorthand for an entire people group. They are, naturally, cannibals because, you know, we are in darkest Africa, right? <laughs> this tribe is incredibly superstitious, assuming that Tarzan, whom they've yet to see, is some sort of forest god to whom they offer gifts of food and arrows. Tarzan can outfight, outthink, and otherwise outperform not just any individual of this tribe, but the entire tribe. Probably the only redeeming feature Burroughs grants to the tribe is a backhanded one. 
When they are nearing the peak of their villainy, Burroughs relates this, quote, To add to the fiendishness of their cruel savagery was the poignant memory of a still crueler barbarity practiced upon them and theirs by the white officers of that arch-hypocrite Leopold II of Belgium. Blame it on the Congo? Not exactly. Burroughs doesn't really cut the tribe much slack, and they are constantly compared unfavorably with Tarzan and any other Europeans. Now, how did Tarzan get to be so awesome? That's an interesting question. You know, for centuries, people have argued over the whole nature versus nurture question. And in Tarzan's case, the answer is provided and is surprisingly both. On the physical front, Tarzan can seem to attribute his awesomeness mostly to nurture. Raised from six months of age by the apes, he exhibits strength, stamina, and flexibility that no human can approach. For this, he should thank the apes. His discovery of his human father's hunting knife and the way in which its use transforms him into a formidable fighter seems to be the only place where nature, Tarzan's human DNA, comes to play a part on the physical side. On the other hand, Tarzan's entire mental facility seems to come from nature. None of the other apes rise into his league. Tarzan manages to teach himself to read and write English without ever hearing the language spoken or having anyone with whom to work. Who does that? I'll tell you, nobody. Once he has someone to teach him, Tarzan does learn to speak almost perfectly. But does he learn the English that he can already read and write? No, he learns French. He's amazing. Oh, oh and he learns to drive also. What accounts for Tarzan's amazing abilities? Apparently, it is his English DNA, and specifically, his aristocratic English DNA. An entire tribe of Africans doesn't manage to develop very far above the animals, but a solitary Englishman raised by apes can put them all to shame. Lest you think that Burroughs thought those whose roots lie in Africa were irredeemably ignorant, he does provide the character Esmeralda, a servant of Jane Porter. Apparently, if you hang out with white people long enough, you can make some progress. Here's a typical Esmeralda pronouncement. For the Lord's sake, honey, you all don't mean to tell me that you're going to stay right here in this here land of carnivable animals when all you got the opportunity to escapade on that boat. Don't you tell me that, honey. <laughs> in Burroughs' world, the African will never rise much above fear, superstition, and comic relief. Or they'll serve as a faceless foe, equal parts cowardice and cruelty. Now, in fairness, I'm sure that I would completely fault Burroughs for his own attitudes. He was reflecting the spirit of his day. Just three years after the book appeared, D.W. Griffith premiered his film, The Birth of a Nation, based on the 1905 Thomas Dixon novel, The Klansman. In the same year that Tarzan swung off the printing press, the United States elected President Woodrow Wilson, hardly an enlightened man on racial matters. Still, I read Tarzan of the Apes with discomfort. It's unfair of us to hold a thinker of a previous era to the standards of our own time. It's like going to someone else's house and being offended that they don't organize their kitchen like we do ours. That said, when we go into that unfamiliar kitchen, we don't have to pretend that we find it the equal of our own kitchen. Now, you can read Tarzan of the Apes or any of Burroughs' many other novels if you like. I won't be checking up on you. If you've read him or you have some thoughts about what I've said, consider dropping a comment down below. Otherwise, get out of here.